With that said, we'll look today at 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 28. And what I'll do at this point is I'll introduce by reading uh, verses 19 to uh, 22 and give you, as I normally do, my introduction. I'm going to spend a lot of time, I'll, I'll let you know in advance, I'll be spending a lot of time uh, in these opening verses uh, and, uh, you know, because there's so much to give. And so let's begin reading together here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 at verse 19. I'll read verses 19 through 22 and we'll get into our study. Paul writes, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So what we're looking at are final instructions. We're looking at the final exhortations that the Apostle Paul is bringing to the church in Thessalonica. And he's already been laying some things out. He's already been saying things they're not to do. And we went through that last time. Now, don't retaliate. He said, pursue what is good. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Be thankful. Now, they're great commands. Those are wonderful commands. I don't want to retaliate. I do want to pursue what is good. Rejoice. I want to pray. I want to be thankful. I want all of those things. But how can I fulfill those things? How can I do those things? How can I resist retaliating? How can I pursue what is good, to rejoice, to pray, to be thankful? You see, that's not something that we as human beings seem to be able to do on a consistent basis. Even when we greatly desire to live like that, it seems impossible. So what is it that can make it possible for these things to actually be essentials, for these kinds of things to be the core of my life? What is it that can make it possible for me to actually be able to do those things? You see, when I pick up my Bible and I read my Bible, uh, and this is something that people may fail to understand or even realize, when I pick up my Bible and read it, well, there are many commands that are given to Christians. You know, there are those who say, well, you know, we live under grace and there are really no actual commands. Well, no, there are. There are quite a number of commands. One author listed over 1,000 New Testament commands. There are commands to abstain from certain things, to avoid certain things, or to ask for certain things. We're commanded to be something, to not be something, to consider something, to continue in something, do something, or to not do something. The list seems endless. And I see commands. But as I see the commands, I have so little ability to perform that which I'm commanded to do. It reminds me of something that the Apostle Paul wrote when he was writing to the church in Rome in chapter 7, when he had said in verses 18 and 19, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. So what can make it possible for us to do what the Bible clearly commands us to do? What is it that I need if I'm going to live a life of obedience? Now remember, Jesus said this. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, I do love him. But what do I need in order to keep his commandments? Well, the answer is being given to us in this passage. I need to be filled by God's Holy Spirit. I need his power in my life. There's something that we need to remember as Christians. We need to remember that the Christian life is a supernatural life. It's not a philosophic system. It's not positive thinking. It's not principles of success. The Christian life is made possible by the Holy Spirit who lives within us and empowers us. Now, Jesus spoke of this when he was teaching his disciples concerning being his follower. On, uh, on his last night with the disciples, he was celebrating Passover with them. They're together, and as they're together, he's teaching them many things. And as he taught them, he told them clearly that he was going to depart from them. In John 13, 36, he said, Where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Well, when he said this, Peter and the other apostles were upset. They were concerned, and, and that prompted Jesus to give them a word of comfort. He said in John 14, 1, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. 
And so he went on to give them a promise, and that promise that he gives them is intended to encourage and to sustain them. He made it clear he's not abandoning them. He made it clear to them that he's not leaving them without support. In John 16, verse 7, he said, I tell you the truth, it's actually to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper, speaking of the Holy Spirit, the Helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. And so I need to be often reminded that Jesus promised to send the Spirit to be with me. He, again, in chapter 14 of John's Gospel, verses 16 and 17, he said it like this. He said, I will pray the Father. He will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So the Bible teaches us that when we receive Christ, when we confess our sin, we forsake our sin, and we, we say, Christ, be, Jesus, be merciful to me. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from my, my unrighteousness. God, I need you. Help me. I need to be born again. Well, when we're born again, we become what the Scripture calls God's temple. Now, among all the religions of the world, you Christians might find this interesting, that is the most amazing promise, that we would become the temple of God, that the God of the entire universe dwells in us. The Bible says that the Spirit of, of God himself will come into our life and live within us. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Paul asks the question, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And you have to ask yourself, how amazing is that? What an amazing promise. We're not alone. We're not left to do it on our own, in our own strength, trying to be good and all of that. We're not alone. God said he'd dwell in me. Again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? We are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. And so the church, by creation, is spiritual, being birthed by the Spirit of God on what is called the day of Pentecost. Now, after Jesus' resurrection, he had told the apostles to go to the city of Jerusalem, and he said, wait there. In Luke 24, 49, he said, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Well, in Acts 1, verse 8, it says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so the promise that he would be keeping was to fill them, to baptize them, but fill them with his Holy Spirit. And this is a, a promise you find uh, in various places in the Old Testament, one of those places being in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, where God said afterwards, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, which I do a lot. And your young men will see visions, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. It's a promise. I will pour out my spirit upon them in those days, these last days. <clears throat> While the apostles waited for the promise, it was fulfilled on Pentecost. It says in Acts 2, 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and, and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what happened, or rather what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And that's called the birthday of the church. Followers of Jesus Christ, baptized by the Holy Ghost. So that reveals to us that the church is not a building. It's not just a group of people meeting at a certain time in a certain location. It shows us that the, the church is actually what is called a divine institution. The church is actually a family of believers in Jesus Christ. 
And it's the church who are the temple of the Spirit of God. Now, you would think that God dwelling in us would make it just an easy way to live, that we, our lives would just flow. God dwells in us. So what could keep us from praying, from rejoicing, from being thankful? Well, though we are the temple of the Spirit, it's possible to resist Him in our lives. We can quench the Holy Spirit. And, and that's what Paul is addressing. This is what Paul is concentrating on as he's closing out his letter to the Thessalonians. And that's where we pick up when he says in verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. If they're going to be what God intends them to be, if we're going to be what God intends us as the church to be, we are not to quench the Holy Spirit. How are they going to be able to comfort? How are they going to be able to edify and honor, to be in peace and forgive and to pray and to rejoice together? How can they do that? By being careful to not quench the Holy Spirit. Now, the word quench, when he says it in verse 19, do not quench, that word means to, to extinguish, to suppress, to stifle the Spirit's influence. Now, what empowers us to resist retaliating, to pursue what is good, to pray, to rejoice, to be thankful? Well, it's the influence, presence, and power of the Holy Spirit of God. You see, when we're walking in the Spirit, these are the things that are called the fruit of His work in our lives. These are the things that reveal that we have a relationship with the Lord. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, and 23, it says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and he goes on to say there is no law against these things. But these things can be quenched when the fire is not kindled and is neglected. When the fire is smothered or drenched in water and the flame can be extinguished. Now how can the flame of the Spirit be suppressed or stifled? There are a variety of things that, that can cause this kind of thing to happen. And I want to share with you a few of those things as I develop this. We can quench the work of the Holy Spirit by taking a theological stance that denies Him the freedom to move in our lives. We can adapt beliefs of our favorite teachers that are not scripturally correct. You see, there are teachers who will limit the promise of the power of the Holy Spirit. They'll say things like, well, the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, have ceased to exist. They, they died out with the death of the last apostle, even though the scripture doesn't say that anywhere. But they'll say that. It's called cessationist teaching. And, and, and the result is that we begin to try and live out our Christian lives and our own willpower. There's a writer that I appreciate. His name is A.W. Tozer. And Tozer said, If Christians are forbidden to enjoy the wine of the Holy Spirit, they will turn to the wine of the flesh. Christ died for our hearts, and the Holy Spirit wants to come and satisfy them. So instead of learning to walk in the Spirit, we can live in the energy of our efforts, our own flesh. We can have the appearance of fruit of the Spirit, but it's simply an imitation. It only looks like real fruit. It's like when you go to a, a, a shop and you see these artificial roses and it looks beautiful. It looks even real and sometimes they're even scented to, to, to appear as if they're the real deal, but they're not. They're just imitation. And there are a lot of people who can live out Christian lives with an appearance of something. They can appear to be patient and loving and kind and good. And, and in many ways, in comparison to others, they may very well be in comparison to others. But that's not, that's not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's the fruit of their efforts. It's something that they believe. But it's in reality something that is not produced by God's Holy Spirit. And when they profess to be Christians and are producing that kind of outward appearance, people can think that that's the fruit of the Spirit, when in fact it's not. When in fact it's simply they're nice people. When I, met my, uh, when I first met, the day I met the young woman who became my wife, when I met Marie, she was the nicest girl I'd ever spoken to. It took me a while to destroy that, but she, she was nice. But she wasn't saved. She was just one of the nicest women I'd ever met. Because she had that kind. That was her character. That's the way she was. But it wasn't of the Spirit. It wasn't because she was a Christian. It simply was because she was a good woman. She was just a good person and all of that. So I learned a long time ago that you can, you can have something that appears to be real when in fact it's not. Now, I've used this story 
before, and some of you have heard it, so you can, you know, just read your Bibles while I tell it so you're not bored. When we moved into a, a home we had in, here in, in Chino, I went into the backyard, and the previous owners had left behind a, a potted plant. It was ivy, and it was, it was really bright green. It was very nice, and I thought, wow, what a blessing. I have a, a plant. I, I, I happen to like plants. I'm not good with them, but I like them. And so I, I said, I'll do my best to keep this thing alive. And so I would water it like twice a week. I'd go out, and it was close to the, the, where I had the, the water nozzle and all the, the hose, and I, I would water it. And uh, but I, I did it for a while. It stayed green. I'd even speak to it. I, you know, it's crazy, I know. But I'd walk up and say, oh, you're such a good plant. You're a great plant. Yeah, I like you. You're, you're a good plant. And water, water, water. And so we took off for a while, and I forgot to water it for like three or four weeks. And I have a habit of doing that. And so I went into the backyard, and, and there it is, nice and green. And I'm thinking, wow, what an amazing plant you are. You're a good plant. I'm talking great plant. And I reached down and I actually patted it. I said, you're a great. It was plastic. And so <laughs> imitation can look real. It, it can look, and I'm like, I, I, oh my goodness, not again. It's a plastic plant. There are people who have the outer appearance. Nice people. They seem to be good people. They're nice in every way. And they, oh, they must be a Christian when in fact, they're not. When, when I got saved, I came out of the time of the Jesus movement. I was 20 years old. I was growing my hair long. I, you know, the people didn't like us. They didn't like us. And, and so they would look at us and they would, they, they, those, those people, they don't know God. They're, they're, they're phonies. Those are hypocrites. They're pretending. Those hippies are no good. They're just, you know, and that's what they said about us. And, you know, and, 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 that's, and, and you know, we didn't wear shoes. I, I didn't wear shoes teaching Sunday morning services. For the first month or two, I, I would sit down in a, in a chair and I didn't wear shoes. I'd kick off my, my, uh, my um, flip-flops and I would kick them off to the side and I would teach. And, and I wouldn't wear shoes because and, and, I was still at heart. I was a hippie. And so my mom, it was my mom who said, you know, I'm sick of looking at your feet. Please put some shoes on, son. You know, you're giving the word of God and all. And I'd say, well, Mom, I'm on holy ground. You know, you're not supposed to have shoes. But it didn't work, so I had to start wearing shoes. You know, but the hippies, they did not like us. Some of you are old enough to remember that. They didn't like us. They thought we were phonies, you know, because the outer appearance. People get caught up with the outer appearance. They think that something that, that, that looks real must be real. It's got to be. And so it's always been that way. You know, it was the long hair. There was a time in the history of the church, I think it, it may still be, to, in some quarters it still remains because I still hear people uh, or read people posting, you know, you know these, these Christians, they can't be Christians because they have tattoos, right? They can't be Christians because they have tattoos. You know, it's always the outer appearance. It's always looking at what's on the outside, you know. You know, I've seen some people with piercings and things, and I think, oh, you, you, that had to hurt. You, that, that had to hurt. And don't you set off the metal detectors when you go, you know, uh, that has to hurt. And then, then there was this thing, I don't know if it's still going on, where, where the, the, the women were tattooing their lower back. You know, they had the, they'd put a hummingbird on their back, right? And I think, and that's going to be a vulture. You live long enough, and that little thing's going to spread its wings, you know. And when you walk, it's, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't, that doesn't make them a non-Christian. It just makes them funny. <laughs> but people get caught up with the outer appearance. And sometimes you can act in such a way that you're actually stifling the spirit. You're walking in your flesh. And that is going to lead to spiritual frustration and fatigue because at a certain point, you're going to get tired of trying to be good. I've never seen a fruit tree with rooted and grounded. I have never seen one struggling to produce an orange or an apple. They're just rooted and grounded. And Jesus said when we're rooted and grounded in him, he said, you will produce fruit. So it's the rooting and grounding in Christ that's producing the fruit of the Spirit. 
There's the discipline of the Christian life. There's a forsaking certain things, avoiding certain things, and all of that. But the fruit is produced by the Holy Spirit. So instead of learning to walk in the Holy Spirit, we may be walking in the energy of the flesh. We can also quench the Spirit by going beyond what the Scripture teaches about the Lord. And that can occur by adding our personal experiences to what the, the Word of God says. There was a time in the church where people were claiming, for example, that the Holy Spirit was working so, so tremendously upon them that, that they got drunk in the Spirit. Some of you have been Christians long enough to remember that term. Oh, they were drunk in the Spirit and all. And so they said that they were drunk in the Spirit. Others would say that they were slain in the Holy Spirit. And, and there are those who claim that, well, God's Spirit made me say this or God's Spirit made me do this. So anything that is claimed to be provoked by God should be tested. We'll see this in a moment by the Word of God. But charismatic excess has caused people to avoid seeking the power of God. So denying the work of the Spirit quenches him. Going too far grieves him. So we can quench the Spirit. We can quench the Spirit by trusting in our own strength, our own intellect. We can think that our own efforts, our ideas, our, 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 the way we think and all of that, our plans, that, 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 that is God's work. And we need to remember it's the Holy Spirit who's the one who energizes us and inspires us as we serve Him. We're not to attempt to live the Christian life in the resources of our own flesh again. Tozer said it like this. He said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on, and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop, and everybody would know the difference. I remember that uh, there were meetings that I had with my pastor, Pastor Chuck, and Pastor Chuck was the uh, pastor of Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, my pastor, and he had put me in, on a board uh, overseeing ministry and this and that. And we would meet for, with several other men, we would meet for the planning sessions for conferences and things of that nature. And Pastor Chuck uh, would walk into the room as the men, a number of us were seated in the room, and Chuck would, move, would walk in and he'd go and he always sat in the same place. And, and uh, even though we were all men pastoring our churches and all, the moment our pastor walked in, we respectfully became quiet and waited and he sat down and when he would sit it'd be quiet for a moment as he settled in and then somebody inevitably would ask this question every time I was in the meeting I heard this question first question Pastor Chuck what are you most concerned about today today you ask that question what are you most concerned about well I'm concerned about the election I'm concerned about this I'm concerned about that I'm concerned you know there's all these things that were concerned. What are you concerned about? The first thing he would say was he would, he would quote out of the book of uh, Galatians in chapter 3. He said, Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? He said, The thing that concerns me most is that we don't do ministry in our flesh. That we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we need to have that in our Christian lives and we also need to remember that we can quench the Holy Spirit by living a life that enjoys and practices sin we can quench the Holy Spirit in our lives by by compromise uh, by living unholy lives by neglecting our prayer time and no longer reading scripture by avoiding fellowship by by neglecting the, the way that we live by yielding to pride yielding to the culture, and we can quench him. And we can indulge our flesh to the point that our, our heart gets calloused. It, it can come to the point where we no longer hear or care to hear what the Word of God says. Never become attached to anything that continues to quench the Spirit of God. We can resist his promptings because we doubt, or we can resist his, his promptings and leadings because of our pride. We can quench him. We, we can fear stepping out in faith or trusting him. We can resist doing what we sense he's prompting us to do. 
when our church was, was young, we, we uh, rented various places. We, we started in a house. We went to a place called Vine Street, rented a small church building there. We went to Central School. We started renting at Ontario Christian Elementary. And while we were at Ontario Christian, the, um, the people who were in charge of that school wanted us out. And so they gave us a time that we were going to have to be out. And so now it's time for us to look for a place to meet. And we found one. It was on Maple Street in San Antonio in Ontario, right by Francis. It was a, uh, at one time it had been a children's home, three and a half acres, and it had a 10,000 square foot building on it. And I remember going to look at it, and it had been abandoned. We spoke to the owner, began to kind of negotiate with him about buying it, and he set a price for us. At, I forget how much it was exactly. It was like $750,000 at that time. Now you buy a 1,200 square foot home for that. But it was 10,000 square feet, three and a half acres. We didn't receive offerings. For the first like 11 years of our, our ministry, we didn't receive offerings. We had agape boxes, which we still have. We didn't receive offerings. And so we had the ability to qualify for about $600,000 loan. But we didn't have the 180. And I remember getting concerned about that and thinking, I know the Lord would like us to be here. I, I believe he do. But Lord, we don't have the money. And, and I, I will not go to the church and speak to the church about that. I don't want to trust in the arm of man. I want to trust in you. But Lord, you're going to have to lead me to the resources because I don't have them. And, and that was very serious for me. And I was going through that on a personal level for some time as the day was coming for us to have to move out of the uh, rather the uh, Ontario Christian. And so finally it got to the point where I, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. And I was driving home from the office in the afternoon on a Thursday. And as I was driving, I just, I just wept to the Lord. And I know that surprises you that I can get emotional, but I did. And I started crying. And I said, God, I don't know what to do. Because he was impressing me. He's, he was impressing me. He was saying to my heart, go and talk to Pastor Chuck. And I said, no, no, no. Go to talk to Chuck. No. And I drove home. And we lived in, in Chino. I went home and I walked into the, to the house. It was already dark. And so the front room, dining room area was, was, uh, was dark. But the kitchen area was open, Marie, lights were on, my wife was, was making dinner as I walked in, and I said, that's a nice change. But anyway, so I walked in, <laughs> just kidding. So I walked in, and I sat at the dining room table in the dark, and I was praying, I had my hands down, and, and I was emotional as, as I was tearing up, and Lord, I, I, I no. So Marie walks through the door, she's right there, and she says, what's wrong? And I said, the Lord is, I believe the Lord is telling me to go to talk to Chuck. And I don't want to. And she just very quietly, the way my wife is, says to me, you just need to do what God tells you to do. And she went back into the kitchen. That was all she said to me. And I said, shut up, woman. No, I said... <laughs> So I, so I got on the phone. I called a couple of my assistants, one of them, Randy Walls, who now pastors the church, Calvary Chapel Upland. And I said, Randy, I said, we need to go. I have to go see Chuck. It's Thursday night. It's a Thursday night Bible study. So we get in the car, he and one of the other guys and I, and off we go. And we're listening at that time. You could hear his live broadcast on his Thursday night. We heard them sign off, and we weren't there yet. It was like another 10 minutes, 15 minutes to get there. So I knew that Chuck would normally stick around for a while. So 
pulled into the parking lot. We walked on in and walked into the foyer at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And nobody's there. It's all, nobody's there. It's all empty except for here comes his assistant, a man named Romaine. Romaine was one of these no-nonsense guys. And he walks up to us and he says, what do you guys want? That was Romaine. And I said, I want to see Chuck. He said, who are you? And I said, I'm your daddy. No, I said, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I said, I'm David, David, I pastor Ontario. He goes, who are these guys? I said, they're my assistants. And he said, I feel sorry for you. That was Romaine. And he laughs. And walk, he says, when if Chuck won't see you? I said, then I drive home. It's up to him. He says, okay. He comes back a moment later. He says, Chuck will see you. And so we go walking up and through this empty church, kind of like walking through here into the back where Chuck's office was. I sit down and I start speaking to Pastor Chuck. And I told him the situation. And I said, you know, Chuck, I said, I believe that if I were to approach the board overseeing Ontario Christian Elementary, I said, I believe it would be possible. Now, I didn't know for sure whether it was or not. I was simply telling him what I thought at the moment. I said, I, I believe it, it, it could be possible for us to get a loan from him. I said, but I don't want to ask them. I don't want them to say, and I was remembering Abram and, and all what happened when his nephew Lot had been taken and all uh, in the book of Genesis, and, and he refused, Abram refused to take things from the, uh, the people in Sodom and all. Lest, he said, you should say, I made Abram rich. I said, I don't want to ask lest they say I made Calvary Chapel rich. And Chuck looks at me and he goes, how much did you need? I said, 180000 He goes, that's not that much. And I looked at him. I said, to you? To you? But to me, I don't have it. And I remember him just nodding his head. He said, I'll... Let me think about it. The next day we get a call, and the next day Pastor Chuck, out of his own resources, lent us $180,000 so we could get the Maple Street building. And we paid that loan off in less than a year. We just took, we just, that's what we do here. We just take care of our bills, and that's what we did. And so I had to learn that sometimes the Holy Spirit can be quenched if you refuse to do what he's leading you to do. I had to learn that there were times I had to die to certain things in order that he could show me his ways. And as Christians, uh, we want to know the Lord. We want to know him in a, a deeply personal way. And that, that way, uh, the way that that can happen is for us to cultivate uh, this, this, this desire to know him more daily. We want to learn to hear his voice. Psalm 63 verse 1 says, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Spend time with him. In his word, in prayer. And in the midst of the noise of this world that screams for your attention. You can hear the voice of the one you love. We had a small building. It sat 120 people. And we had to use a section of it for our children's ministry. And we had a few babies in the nursery, maybe four or five. And uh, I can still remember giving midweek studies or a Sunday night study. And uh, you could hear the babies because it wasn't insulated. You could hear babies cry. And I could look and I could see the faces of the mothers. And you'll see the mama who will hear a baby cry. And you could see her eyes. And she'd actually looked in my direction. It was a very small building. She'd look in my direction, but I could see her faces, but her eyes were looking towards the wall. And so I'm thinking, oh, she must have one of her babies. And I'd see that. And then you'd see the woman look, and then she'd relax. You'd see another woman look, and she'd relax. And then there's the one who stayed tense. 
that was her baby. She recognized the voice of her baby. Mamas do that. You can have several little kids crying, but the mama always recognizes her own brat. <laughs> well, I discovered that the Lord can speak in a way that in the midst of everything that would distract us, we can hear his voice. If we listen, he's our father. We need to remember that a fire is put out by withdrawing fuel. And neglecting the things of the Lord will give place to our flesh and will quench the work of the Holy Spirit. Be careful that you don't yield to your flesh. We can neglect our gifting. We can quench the Spirit when we begin to yield to the pressures of the day. We can become distracted by the cares and concerns to the point that we, we don't think He can move. We don't think that He can do anything. When we got saved during the uh, Jesus movement in 19, I got saved in 1970, and that movement, there were so many negative things going on, but we discovered that these things can be changed by the power of the Spirit when God gets hold of people's lives, and that's what he did in the Jesus movement, is, is he grabbed hold of the generation of the young, and the young went out and did the work of ministry, when sometimes those who were older and had been doing ministry for a long time, when they didn't believe that God could do something, but we believed that he could, and he did, and he will. And we need to be aware of that. And instead of quenching him, we, we should be stirring up what the Word of God tells us he'll do. In 2 Timothy 1.6, uh, Paul said to Timothy, I remind you, stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Return to your first love and be open to what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Hold fast to him and, and be open to what he can and will do through you. And so he speaks in that way and he and there's your introduction. Do not quench the Spirit. Then we move into verse 20. Do not despise prophecies. The church is a spiritual body with various gifts of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, it says, The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So in the church, there are members who have the gift of prophecy. And this gift is not always uh, prophecies of future events, though it can be. We saw that in the book of Acts. But in the life of the church, the gift of prophecy spiritually strengthens believers. It's often exercised in Bible studies. There, there are times when the Holy Spirit will, will inspire an, uh, an illustration of some sort that grabs hold of somebody who's sitting out there. I remember a lady approaching me after I had taught a Bible study, and she said, the things that you were saying, uh, those things pertain to my son. They were like... Like, he thinks, she told me this, he thinks that you came and talked to me about him, and he's mad. So she said, please don't say those things again. I said, I didn't plan those things out. Where's your brat? No, I didn't, I didn't plan those things out. That's the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit sometimes will do that kind of work where, where somebody is hearing something through an illustration or a story that applies straight to them. It happens quite often. God will move in that way. And people will hear those things, uh, and, and God will do the move by His Spirit. And, and uh, we need to know that through this, this gift, uh, it, it encourages and it builds up the body of Christ. The, the Scripture in 1 Corinthians 14, 3 says, He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. So we're not to disregard it when we know that the Lord is speaking. You need to know that. The gift is intended to guide, to strengthen believers as they serve the Lord. It can be used to speak of future events. There are times when the Lord will say, this is what I want you to do. I remember again that there was a time when we were at the Vine Street location. Our church, once again, was, was a young church. We had maybe 60 to 80 people at the most. And, and I had just finished a particular book study. I was preparing for the next and I had been praying in advance for like three weeks, Lord, what would I teach next? And I kept getting this impression, uh, you need to teach the gospel of Mark. And I argued with the Lord for some reason. I, I said, no, uh, you know, people who show up haven't heard the introduction. They may come in in the eighth chapter. And I was arguing, and I heard so many times very distinctly, teach the gospel of Mark. And after a Sunday morning service, when I was concluding the study, a woman I've never seen before and 
I haven't seen since. Him walking up to me after church. I was standing in the front there in this little fellowship in Vine Street there in Ontario. And she walks up to me and, and she says, Hello, my name is so-and-so. This is the first time I've ever been here. And I think you need to teach the gospel of Mark. And I looked at her and I said, Get out of here. No, I looked at her and I said, Oh, we started the gospel of Mark the next week. Because there are times when the Lord will do that kind of thing. I had been praying, and it was verified. So we need to be aware of those things. Now, when someone speaks a word, it needs to be tested. Notice verse 21, test all things and hold fast what is good. Now, the thing that's been declared as being from God must line up with God's declared word. In 1 Corinthians 14, verses 29 through 33, two or three prophets should speak and the other should weigh carefully what is said. If a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. You see, sometimes someone may have a well-meaning prophecy and prophesy or say things that are simply not true. A woman approached me one time after a church service and said, this is my first time once again. We were meeting over there in the chapel at the time, and she said, this is my first time I've been here, and I have a word from the Lord for you. And I said, well, say on. She, and she kind of stopped for a moment, went into her prophetic pose, I guess. And, and she says, um, the Lord is saying that if you begin to hold church services on a Saturday rather than a Sunday, he will bless your church. And I said, no, he's not. You are. Because I don't bear witness with that. There are times when people will approach you to throw their own heart on you rather than what the Spirit actually says. You have to test the Spirit and hold fast to that which is good and true. You have to do that. And so what we do is we have to test those things and hold fast. And finally, in verse 22, continuing, he says, abstain from every form of evil. The word form means every manifestation. It can mean every kind or appearance. So avoid or keep a distance from moral evil in every way and every kind of moral evil. That, again, is calling for uh, discernment. If a supposed prophetic utterance does not lead you to Christ, demonstrating love and purity of lifestyle and a hunger for things that glorify God, it's to be avoided at all costs. And so these are the things he's saying. Be very careful that you stay true to the declared word of God and true to the things that you know to be the truth and avoid these other things. Therefore, exercise discernment of the Spirit to make sure that you stay in the will of the Lord. And so finally, we close with verses 23 through 28. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And so he closes by saying, verse 23, may God completely set you apart for his service. May every element of your being be ready to see Jesus when he comes for us. He says, he who, in verse 24, calls you as faithful, only God can answer this kind of request. God is faithful. God will do it. The nature of God and his love and goodness towards us will give us faith to ask. And he goes on to say, brethren, verse 25, pray for us. I need your prayers, he's saying, just as much as you need mine. Please keep us in prayer. And then 
Verse 26, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. When I was a brand new Christian, I liked that verse. Because we had a lot of pretty little hippie girls in the Bible studies. And that, that, God gave me permission to greet them with a holy kiss. Until I discovered that the men would kiss the other men. And so I, I broke that command. What it means is love one another. If there's anything that the church should be known for, it's for love. The love of God, love of one another, and a concern for those who don't know him. When someone walks into a church congregation, this one or any other, it is our prayer that when they walk out, they can say, there's a love of God there. These people love the Lord. I may not agree with them, I may not even like being around people like that. But they are genuine. They are real. We need to learn to love one another. So greeting with a holy kiss is just another way of saying love one another in the Lord. And then finally, the last two things. Read this epistle. May the whole church hear it. And then he closes by saying, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. May God's grace be with you in the midst of all that you go through all the persecution all the rejection all the concerns may you always understand one thing that it's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that keeps you together may you trust in him may you love him may you serve him may you love one another and may you reach this world that needs God and you can do it if you remain in the faith, if you remain strong in the spirit, if you love the word, if you pray for each other, if you love each other, and then you take that good news out of the four walls of where you're at and give it to those who so desperately need it. May God help us to live out this epistle in our lives. We're living in the last moments of the last days. May we be found faithful as we serve Jesus Christ with all that is within us.